On December 25th, 1995, I killed Dean Martin. I didn't want to. It wasn't something I'd planned on doing for the holidays. I was 12 at the time, so at this point, my long-term Christmas goals were convincing my mom to buy me CDs that had parental guidance stickers on them. Killing one of America's most beloved entertainers was nowhere on my wish list, but it happened, and it's my fault. I killed Dean Martin. But how could I, a scrawny 12-year-old kid in San Diego at the time of his death, have killed Dean Martin when he died in a gated mansion in Beverly Hills? How could I have killed him when his cause of death was not murder? Who is Dean Martin? <laughs> All fair questions. Most people, including me at the young age of 12, thanks to my World War II submarine captain of a grandfather, knew Dean Martin as the singer who wasn't Frank Sinatra in the Rat Pack. <laughs> the Luigi to Sinatra's Mario. The goose to his Maverick. The guy you didn't think the Mafia would kill your entire family for. Or they knew Dean Martin for being the soft, melodic voice of one of our favorite, yet horribly aged Christmas songs, Baby, It's Cold Outside. <laughs> but amazingly, even less people know how Dean Martin became famous. I'd always just assumed Dean was famous. But on this Christmas morn in 1995, my mom gifted me with a three-part docuseries about the rise and fall of the comedy duo of Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. I'm sorry, comedy duo? Like a team, like Abbott and Costello, like a comedy team. Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis were a comedy team and people liked it. <laughs> they loved it. Dean wasn't famous because of his voice or his friendships with Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. He was famous because of Jerry Lewis. Yep, <laughs> the nutty professor. Jerry Lewis is not only responsible for the Rat Pack or your favorite holiday song about holding women hostage, He's essentially responsible for helping to usher in what was considered cool from 1945 to 1970. But at that point in my life, the only things that I thought were cool was whatever my older sister told me. And in 1995, my sister was 17 and the coolest person on the planet. She wore starter jackets. She stole me my first cassette tape, Digital Underground Sex Packets. I mean, she smoked cigarettes for God's sakes. There's no way my sister would think Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis were cool, and why my mom thought it, I'd like it was beyond me. I had gotten into Monty Python, and of course it was 1995, so Jim Carrey was king. I assume my mom thought Martin and Lewis were a good mix of both. She had piqued my interest, and I wanted to know more. I wanted to pop in the first tape right away, but I tried to gauge my sister's interest. I wasn't going to ask her to sit and watch Martin and Lewis with me. That wouldn't be cool. That might be lame. My sister was not lame although she was hilarious. She'd always been funny. It just oozed out of her. And what's more, we loved being funny together. I'd argue that my earliest comedic sensibilities were inspired by her. We lived in an Irish Catholic household where we quickly found being funny was the only way to survive. <laughs> there was constant arguing, fighting, and an all-around sense that at any point one of us was going to go to hell. Being the youngest, I could get away with a lot just by my boyish charm, but my sister was often in the middle of it all. The only way I could rationalize my sister's temper was that it was consistently matched by her legitimate goofiness. And when the arguments turn to holes in the wall, you need to find something to help you float above it. Trying to make each other laugh gave us wings. We would make each other laugh all night, sometimes making up songs or dances or watching in living color and house party and howling at how funny we thought it was. One time, we convinced a couple neighbor kids that we were aliens. My sister started speaking in this crazy language. Bleep, walla, la, bleep, bleep, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I followed her lead and started babbling something. Deep do we do? I might have just been scatting. <laughs> but regardless, these neighbor kids freaked the fuck out and ran home crying. <laughs> it was wonderful. This became one of several inside jokes we had together. When one of us got bored or something in the house got tense, we roll out a few bleep, walla, walla, la, Another running joke was that for an entire year, any time I walked by my sister, she would yell, would you roar like a lion? In reference to the what would you do for a Klondike bar ads. <laughs> we were the only two that thought this was funny. <laughs> and she would say it to me no matter where we were, in the store, on the phone, in church, it didn't matter. Every time she said it, we both giggled and snorted, causing shushes from the pew in front of us. Now here we sat on Christmas morning at a pivotal moment in our relationship. She'd always been showing me the funny things, but I was ready to show her something I'd hoped was funny. And not even that, something our mom thought might be funny. I had everything to lose. <laughs> I leaned over and asked if she wanted to 
But before I could finish the question, she cut me off. Let's watch those old comedy tapes. I couldn't believe it. I hopped up and put in the first VHS. And just to clarify, for anyone born after 1998, VHS is a form of video <laughs> where tiny fairies use flashlights to reenact movies and TV shows with shadow puppets. We both sat on the couch and were immediately hooked. The first tape chronicled how the duo met while performing at the same live variety show. Both their careers were at a dead end and they decided to team up because they had nothing to lose. An extremely young Jerry was bouncing around the stage like a maniac while Dean tried desperately to sing a song. Or the duo were breaking plates over each other's heads or throwing pies. It was chaos. It was punk rock. It was hilarious. It was like watching two best friends having the time of their lives. The tape ended. I looked at my sister. She hadn't really made a noise for the last 40 minutes, but she was just as amazed as I was, which kind of made sense. We were watching chaos, and if there was anything my sister loved more than chaos, it was laughing at it. This was my sister's first Christmas with us in a long time. She'd been living with my dad in Ohio for a few years, and then spent the last two Christmases as either a guest of the state of Ohio or the state of California. She'd been caught up with drugs and stealing, and I was never really privy to all the details. I could just see how much it affected my family and the toll it was taking on them and her. When we were both younger, the holes in the wall and arguments seemed par for the course for a household that still believed that ten Hail Marys could save your soul. <laughs> but my sister had been out in the world, and she'd returned differently, an alien of sorts. The natural smile and goofiness slowly started to morph into faraway looks and frustration. I knew as much about her addictions as I knew about Dean Martin being a comedian, but she was addicted, and oddly enough, he was funny. <laughs> Hell, I had no idea Jerry Lewis was ever considered funny. At this point in my life, I only knew him as the guy who yelled, lady, and put buck teeth <laughs> into his mouth for humor. Had I ever learned, had I never learned this back in 1995, you'd have to convince me that Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin worked together in a comedy space and were successful. I mean, any time anyone says Jerry Lewis, most people don't have positive feelings. It's like when someone says the words Elon Musk or sourdough starter. <laughs> but in truth, Jerry and Dean Martin essentially created sketch comedy. They were the godfathers of the televised, televised variety show. They pioneered modern day comedy and almost no one gives them credit. And sometimes they murder them on Christmas day. My sister sat back down. We plopped a blanket over our laps and it immediately felt like years ago before she left for Ohio and before the addictions took hold. We were just two kids again watching funny on the TV. Tape two was all about Martin and Lewis's stardom. They were huge, massive. They had the number one radio show, TV show, and movie all at the same time. It's really hard to explain to people nowadays just how famous they were, but it's like if Beyonce and Taylor Swift started a comedy troupe, that famous. <laughs> It was around this time I started to ask my mom some questions about Dean and Jerry. The internet wasn't anywhere near accessible to the average person yet, so moms were still the best and most reliable source of information. <laughs> Ye old mamapedia. She said Dean was born in Ohio, which my sister and I both agreed might be the most interesting fact about Ohio. She told me Dean was her favorite singer, but that he was an alcoholic. And after they broke up, Jerry became a huge movie star and started hosting an annual telethon to raise money for kids with muscular dystrophy. She started going into why they broke up, and I told her we hadn't gotten there yet. So my sister hopped up and put the final tape in, the breakup. After 10 years of working together, Dean and Jerry called it quits. In this tape, you could see Dean drinking more, hanging with Sinatra all the time, and the chaotic sketches became less funny and more structured, and neither looked like they were having much fun. There's, of course, several theories behind why they broke up, but this VHS series was produced and narrated by Jerry Lewis, so only one theory was really explored. <laughs> and that was mainly that the duo had just run its course, and their stardom was too big to keep up with. As the third tape came to an end, my sister and I were so confused. How could two guys walk away from millions of dollars just because they were tired of it? As kids who grew up eating bottom shelf cereal in a bag, this made no sense to us. <laughs> it worked out for them, my mom said. Dean went on to be one of the biggest singers of all time, and Jerry became one of the biggest movie stars. And she was right. They somehow became more famous separately than they ever did together, both having careers most people would kill for after already having careers most people would kill for. But to me, all of their singular achievements meant little compared to what they were together. 
You never know, my sister said. They might get back together. That's impossible, I replied. Dean Martin is dead. <laughs> no, he's not, my mom yelled from the kitchen, almost offended. I said, yes, he is. I remember hearing about it, because in the 90s, we were Google free. And remembering something you heard was all the proof you or anyone else needed. <laughs> Dean Martin is not dead, my mom defiantly replied, but again, offered no evidence. <laughs> yes, he is. Dean Martin is dead, I sternly announced. Clearly, this is the kind of argument that could only be won by whoever was louder or refused to give up. One of those arguments that would be brung up at every family gathering, like the secret of Aunt Barbara's special friend, or... <laughs> A lot of people have Aunt Barbara's out there. I gotta... <laughs> we raged on. But to save us from ourselves, or just to announce that she had no interest in the truth, my sister turned on the TV, hoping to draw our attention with the parade or the 10th airing of a Christmas story. But instead, there was breaking news. Today, from Beverly Hills, Dean Martin has died. <laughs> Our jaws dropped. <laughs> My sister loudly asked, what the fuck did you do? <laughs> My mom's eyes darted at me from across the room. Wait, what did I do? Of course, it's silly then, and even sillier now, to think that I killed Dean Martin. But that doesn't stop me from holding on to a small amount of guilt every time I think about it, as if I did play a small role. Like Dean was Tinkerbell, and I killed him by not believing, or clapping my hands, or something stupid like that. If only I'd clap my hands for my sister a little more. Maybe, just maybe, this wouldn't have been the first Christmas she'd spent with us in years. Maybe she wouldn't have let her temper win. Maybe, just maybe, this wouldn't be the end of the duo. I always knew what my sister and I were together. We were funny, ridiculous, and chaotic. But unlike Dean and Jerry, that's where the success stopped for at least one of us. She spiraled further and further, and I just kept trying to dance above it. I had to. There's only so many times you can see your sister get arrested or watch gang members and drug dealers threaten your mom, your house, or you before you have to think of your favorite song or joke and ignore it. Just float above it. You have to fill your mind with good memories, the silly moments here and there that give you the ability to reflect positively on someone instead of all the awful they caused and the downright terrible things you had to witness. Like a true Irisher, I had to push it all down deep and continue to do so where it will sit and stew and eventually cause me cancer. That Christmas when I was 12 years old was a memorable one. Not just because you never forget your first kill. <laughs> but because it was the last Christmas I ever had with my sister. A few days later, she would go to jail for stealing, then rehab, then jail, then rehab, until she finally disappeared, and I didn't see her or speak to her again for 12 years. In 1976, on the annual Jerry Lewis Telethon, Frank Sinatra appeared as a guest. He sang a song, and he and Jerry goofed around, and then taking everyone completely by surprise, Frank brought out Dean Martin. It was the first time Dean and Jerry had seen each other since the day they broke up in 1956. They hadn't spoken or seen each other for 20 years. 20 years! Of course, once they did, they couldn't take their eyes off each other. They couldn't stop hugging each other and poking and holding each other's faces. It was to the point where Sinatra told them to knock it off. <laughs> the segment lasted about 15 minutes. Dean blew Jerry a kiss, said I love you, and that was it. They never saw each other again. The last time I ever saw my sister was in 2011, when she randomly showed up for Thanksgiving. None of us had seen her in 12 years. The moment we saw each other, though, we lit up. It was my sister. She'd looked beaten down a bit. She was now 37, and the years away clearly hadn't been kind wherever she was. Dark circles drowned her eyes, and her skin looked unclean in a way that I've never been able to describe. Her hair was perfect, though. No matter how bad things got, she always wanted her hair to be on point. She seemed okay. 
We hugged. And then she immediately asked me what I do for a Klondike bar. <laughs> we both laughed. I would have done anything for one that would have kept her home. We sat around the table. No judgments, no questions about where she'd been or what she'd gotten into. We ate. We talked about movies and memories. And for a few hours, it felt like old times again. Just two best friends having the time of their lives. Then at the end of the night, just like Dean, she kissed me on the cheek. But instead of walking off stage with an I love you, she closed the front door. And then she stole my car. <laughs> Dallas McLaughlin, ladies and gentlemen. Dal